Welcome to Musicians on the Record. I'm David Ward. This is the show where we get the musician story, and I am so psyched today. We're getting freaky. My next guest was given his nickname by legendary bassist Bootsy Collins. His latest album is All the Way This and All the Way That. Please welcome to the show Freak Bass. Welcome, Freak. Hey, it's great to be here. Yes. Thanks Monday for... afternoon, getting the funk going. Absolutely. Thanks for being mm -hmm. here. And um, you are in Cincinnati, Ohio, correct? Correct. Yeah. Beautiful yep. place. I'm in uh, Portland, Maine, in the Motor Studios. When, if you're watching in the live feed or in the replay, let us know where you are watching from in the world. Say hello to Freak Bass. Get your questions in as well. And if you're good boys and girls, he might play for us a little bit later. We're very excited about that. Uh, yeah. let's, let's start with the new album, Freak. Uh, tell me about this and, and how did this get uh, inspired for you? Well, it was really cool because what we did, when we, we were, it was about time for us to release something new and so what we started doing we originally were just releasing some singles so uh we about a year or so ago we kind of released a single every two to three months along with an accompanying video those songs record both in new york and in cincinnati um produced by a gentleman by the name of atal shore atal most people in the music industry will know him is uh he's one of the co-writers of the big Santana hit "Smooth." Um, oh, wow. um, him and something. Him and Rob Thomas wrote it together, nice. and um, uh, they won a Grammy. All kinds of great stuff for that. But he, um, you know, he's also he co-wrote <laughs> Maxwell's first album, uh, uh, "Urban Hang Suite." Did a bunch of stuff with Jewel. All, all kinds of folks. But long story short, so he uh, he's an originally Cincinnati guy. lived in New York. lives in New York now, though. But um, he uh, approached me about you know doing doing some songs. So we kind of started with those. And it got time to do, you know, hey, let's release a full album now. So I was on the road with a uh, gentleman by the name of uh, Alan Evans. Alan Evans is a drummer for a really great group called Soul Life. And um, he, uh, he plays in another uh, project with a guy named Eddie Roberts. Eddie is uh, they call Matador Soul Sounds. Well, Eddie's main band is is called um, uh, New Master Sounds. Great, incredible group. If any of your listeners have listened to them or if they haven't, please check them out. Um, from the UK, came over here to the States a few years back. And um, he said, hey, I, I said, man, you know, we're getting ready to put this new record out. He's like, you should get in touch with Eddie because he's starting this new label called Color Red. And... Um, uh, out of Denver. And uh, so I bumped into Eddie at a few festivals, music festivals here and there. Didn't know him real well, but just shot him an email off. And, um, and you know, he got right back to me in the next, I don't know, hour or two. And he said, hey, you know, you know what you got going on? I sent him some of the stuff we were working on. And he's like, well, let's fly you out here and uh, let's sign you up to Color Red. So we basically, over a couple of emails and some, uh, some phone calls, we uh, Sign with Color Red albums, and the, the way they do records is really great. First off, everything is released only on vinyl. It's the only thing they release on their whole label is on vinyl. It's of course, digital and streaming too, of course, but in terms of physical product, it. it's it's all vinyl. And um, also, when you go out there, they have a studio out in Denver, Colorado. You're recording straight to tape, and when I say tape, I'm not talking like virtual, like Pro Tools version of what tape sounds like. I'm talking straight up analog tape, analog. and because of that, yeah, and a, a big part of it is because that's the way they want the drum for the drum sounds, and they get the, the most amazing drum sounds. And um, so, because of that, also when you record out there, everything is done just like it was back in the day, where everything is recorded in one take. So, you know, we could have a four minute song, and if we get in those last th thirty seconds or so of the song, everybody starts over again. We're all recording once, all simultaneously, no, so no overdubs essentially. Is that right? Yeah, Old I mean, some school. vocal. So, yeah, yeah. Love I mean, we'll it. do a little bit of vocal overdubs here and there. But the ninety percent of what you're hearing is all done in one take as as a band, and uh, and it's wonderful because it just it, you know Eddie's producing this, and it's it just really you hit, it's really easy to create that energy that you do live. That's always a tough thing to do in a, in a studio, as as many of your listeners I'm sure know. And um, and the other great thing about it is when when we went to record or excuse me perform these songs live. There's always that thing of like, okay, now this sounds really cool in the studio. How are we going to treat this live? Right. Like, you know, what are we going to leave in? What are we going to leave out? Yes. Well, the beautiful thing about this is this album, we're like, we're going to do it just exactly like it's exactly like it is in the record. When you see us live, it sounds exactly like it does in the record. There's no differentiation between the two. 
And uh, so, yeah, so it was a really amazing process. We've been getting a really good buzz. The album just got picked up last month in Japan, too, as well, by a really cool funk label called P-Vine Records over there. And uh, so it's starting to get making a little bit of noise out there. And um, uh, yeah, so we're going actually flying out there in November uh, for a week to do the follow up album. Um, I'm, I'm assuming sometime next year we'll get it released once this one starts kind of dying down a little bit. But it's an amazing process. Yeah, it was great. Now, tell me a little bit about who who are the other players in your band who is sure. on the album, please. Let's give them some love as well, because this is great. You're doing this live sort of analog thing again. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, so uh, the uh, the person that's been with me the longest it was is my drummer. Um, his name is Rico Lewis, and uh, Rico uh, played for 15 years with George Clinton and Parliament Funkadelic. So we kind of met because, as you mentioned, you know, I, I work a lot with Bootsy, um, which is one kind of camp in that whole circus. Uh, George Clinton's whole thing is another camp. And and so we kind of met because they were, you know, it was kind of like the summit meeting, you know, of the funk, Funketeers. So he was actually on the road with um, Bernie Worrell for a short while, you know, keyboard player for the late, great, incredible um, uh, Bernie Worrell. And Bernie had done some recording on some of my albums and, and I knew Bernie pretty well. So uh, Bernie was coming through Cincinnati and he said, hey, why don't you come out to the show and sit in? So uh, Rico was already playing with them. I came up on a song with him. Him and I really instantly locked. We knew we would play together. So when it was time for him, to, when I offered him if he wanted to come and join the band, it, what, there's no audition or anything needed because it was like, dude, I already know we play great together. We've already done it. Yeah. Great. So it was awesome. And, and he speaks the same, you know, the funk language. He knows the same language I do. So it was great. So, so Rico Lewis is the drummer. Um, the uh, the singer I work with um, is uh, a lady by the name of Sammy Garrett, and Sammy also tours with a group, amazing group out of New York City called uh, Turquoise, and another big, huge funk group, and um, really big on the festival circuit. And uh, so they would Turquoise. We would do a lot of the same festivals and such. I knew Michelangelo, who's their drummer in their band, and, and whenever they would come through Cincinnati or we'd be at a festival or something on the road. They'd say, "Hey, why don't you come up and you know sit in on a song?" So, um, so I would kind of kind of play with them occasionally, and uh, so Sammy and I kind of started talking. We kind of hit it off really well. I love the way her voice sounded. And when we were doing the singles, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we were doing this song called "Love in Your Pocket," and uh, it's all like, you know, we should really get a, a be great to have a female singer on this tune. And I was like, man, I think I know the exact person. So coincidentally, when he was in town, Turquoise was making a stop through Cincinnati. Nice. They asked me to come sit in with them. I said, Atal, you got to come out to the show with me. He came out, dug, dug the whole thing, dug her a lot. And then from that point on, we started doing uh, recording together. We did a, a, a video for Love in Your Pocket. It's a really great video if you get a chance, kind of space agey looking thing. Um, and... Um, and then we started doing. I was like, "Wow, let's use let's use Sammy again." And we just kept kept using you know using her on different different songs. And then we would sit in and shows together. And you know, I finally came to the day. I was like, you know, Sammy, you're playing with us all the time. Why don't you just be in the band, make right. it easy, you know? <laughs> so uh, so so yeah. So the Sammy, yeah, so she she's uh, she's the, the all the vocals and you hear on that. There's one other vocalist from uh, a couple other vocalists that are in different groups. Adrian D. Leon and also Riley Commissar who plays with us occasionally. But Sammy's the 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 main vocalist and then um and then finally the keyboard player it was of a combination of a couple people um i was playing with uh the my keyboard player was razor sharp johnson and razor was booty's original keyboard player played with uh parliament funkadelic on some big big songs and um so unfortunately last year uh razor had kind of a sudden uh he passed away so you know he was he, he he'd been around yeah it was it was, it was pretty rough at sure. the time um, but he, and we were kind of, that's what we first started doing the singles. But as, as we kept going on, um, there was a key, there was a band out of Cincinnati called, uh, Foxy Shazam and, and a really good group, big group. They were on Capitol records for a while, did a bunch of touring and stuff. And, um, they play Cincinnati has this, um, thing called the Cincinnati entertainment awards that happens once a year. It's kind of, you know, recognizing, uh, the, the Cincinnati music community with, with like an award show and they have performers each year. And I think this was probably 2007, 2008. And I, oh my gosh, I guess it was over 10 years ago, which is weird to think about. But, um, uh, Sky was playing with Foxy Shazam there. And this dude is like a freaking madman on stage. And, and, and I'm kind of a little bit been known to be a little crazy on stage myself. So I was like, <laughs> watching him like, 
I, you know, the whole band was great, but he's the one I kind of like zoned in on. I was like, dude, I, there's, I'm going to end up playing with this cat one day. I know this guy's crazier than I am, you know, so the situation was right. And Foxy wasn't touring at the time. So when it was time, you know, a few years ago, I called him up. I was like, dude, you know, what do you, what do you say? So, uh, he went out, we started hitting it off as well. And, uh, now he's a really good writer too, as well, which is great. So he, he comes over to my place, him and I all the time are writing music just constantly, and so, yeah, so there's there's like the crux of it right there. Now, also, Eddie on the record, Eddie from guitar player from uh, New Master Sounds, who produced uh, that part of the album, also plays some guitar on it, too, as well. But the, the crux of the band is myself, Rico, Sammy and Sky. That's who, who when we tour. That's that's the main touring band. That's fantastic. We are we are giving the bass some love with Freak Bass today. Get your mm-hmm. questions in. And, you know, tell me about your writing process, Freak, as far as with this album and how do you go about, I mean, the, such creativity of just pulling this stuff out of the air and all sure. of a sudden it's a song. Yeah, I mean, you know, some of like for, for this album in particular, the majority of it was written at the studio at Color Red. Like we would have like, I'd have little blueprint ideas for songs that we had, you know, we did little demos with or we'd have kind of grooves and stuff like that. But literally, we would get up, I and mean, we did like five or six songs in three or four days, I think it was. So we, we would get up yeah. 9 or 10 in the morning, start jamming on some tea or coffee, go down to the studio, start start writing some tunes together at, collectively. And uh, and then by about noon, kind of start working out all the parts, the arrangements. And by 3 or 4 or 5 o'clock that day, we were actually cutting the tape. Wow. So And it was a great process, and it worked great for us. And so... Uh, that's why. So again, so we had cut a little bit of loop, you know, I'd have, I'd have little th- either things on my phone or little, just little MP3s of like some, some stuff I've done in the studio just to give us a kind of a rough outline of stuff. But, uh, the majority of it, we kind of, you know, wrote there in the studio. Yeah. Where, where does some of that inspiration in the first place come from freak as far as these songs? Oh, geez. Well, you know, I mean, you know, we were talking about, I'm from Cincinnati, as I told you, and, and, uh, funk has been always been a, uh, you know, a cornerstone of who I am, music I listen to. And a big part of that is from growing up in Cincinnati. I think I, I always get asked if I would have played music if I grew up in a different part of the country or a different part of the world. And I'm sure I would have, I'm not sure necessarily funk, um, because of the influence, uh, for those listeners that don't know, Cincinnati, the James Brown, there was a label in the sixties and always seventies called King records, which were all the James Brown hits were recorded here in Cincinnati, which is how kind of Bootsy got his name on the map. Cause James picked him up cause he was a Cincinnati guy as well. And you know, seventies, eighties, you had Bootsy and then, and Dayton, Ohio zap and Ohio players and, and, uh, slave. And it just goes on. The, the, the list just got midnight star from the eighties, baby face who that's who Bootsy gave him his name as well. Um, so yeah, it's always been a really, really strong, strong, you know, influence here. And I, when I grew up, it was like, when I was a kid, you know, most of my friends were listening to like Nirvana and green day, but I was listening to more like Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg and all that stuff was all samples of the funk, you know? And right. so like by way of that, I was like, so between the fungus at Cincinnati and like some of the early hip hop that I was uh, kind of getting into as a bass player, um, that's kind of where it came from. And um, yeah, so that's kind of where the influence is for the song. Definitely groove based. You know, I started off as a drummer. So whenever I'm writing bass lines, yeah, yeah, that was definitely, I see the drums in the background yeah, right there. Right. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and uh, so I, you know, I always kind of say I'm a drummer that plays notes. That's kind of the way I think about the way I play bass and create bass lines. I almost feel like I'm creating a beat, but my beats just happen to have notes in them too as well. And that's kind of the approach I have to playing bass. So, yeah. I love it. That's fantastic. You know, say a little bit more, Freak, about your story. For those folks who don't know you, what was the dream that was developing when you were coming up and listening to all this great music and somehow you got connected to Bootsy Collins? I'm curious about how that happened. Yeah, well, that was pretty crazy. So um, I started kind of getting my name a little bit around Cincinnati as a bass player and musician. And uh, uh, a gentleman by the name of Gary Cooper, who's known as Mudbone in the P-Funk circles, um, he was in a band in the 80s that was his band called um, uh, Sly Fox. They had a big hit called Let's Go All Away. And um, so like this is like late 90s, early 2000s. And uh, he was... um, kind of looking to put that band back together again and um 
So I would start going over his play. He kind of heard about me as a bass player and asked me if I wanted to play on some demos of his. And I was like, yeah, that'd be, that'd be awesome. And, and, uh, so I didn't even know the P-Funk or Bootsy connection with him or anything at this point. Right. And, uh, so we go over to his place and he'd have, he'd like in his, in his studio, he'd have like videos on in the background and I'd see him. I'm like, wait a minute, you're on the stage with Bootsy. What are you doing on the stage with Bootsy Collins? And he, and, and wait a minute, you're singing all the hooks with Bootsy Collins. What's And you're singing all these songs I know by Bootsy Collins. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah I, I forgot to tell you. I also, you know, I'm, I'm Bootsy singer too as well. And I was like, okay. Yeah. So, um, so we started getting real tight. He was kind of like my first foray into like really knowing the funk and the funk, like in a funk school almost kind of fashion. And uh, so uh, Zappa had a couple years after that. He there's the, that label, which is this is ironic. Remember I told you about the label called P Vine Records, yeah. picking up our album. Well, back in whatever ninety nine, two thousand, two thousand one, they were putting out. Uh, uh, they do a bunch of funk stuff, and they were putting out this uh, album, which was a Jimi Hendrix tribute record. Mm. Um, of songs written by different funk bands about Jimmy, not cover songs, but songs written about Hendrix. Okay. So, so Mudbone asked me, Gary Cooper asked me if uh, I'd be interested in playing bass on the demo for this. And it was him and uh, Michael Hampton, who's known as Kid Funkadelic in the uh, P-Funk world. And um, uh, I said, well, yeah, of course, that sounds great. And he's like, okay, cool, cool. All right, well, we'll be, we're doing it Thursday, doing it over Bootsy's house and then uh, his studio and then and I'll pick you up, blah, blah, blah. Like just kind of off the cup, I'm like, slow down yeah. wait where where are we doing this at <laughs> and he's like oh yeah P bootsy's producing and engineering it i'm like oh okay yeah. so it was like that little cartoon thing where i was like did the uh, thing yeah, right. and uh so you know i went out you know thursday came around and he brought me out to this to bootsy's place and uh you know i mean he opened the door he looked like he was like 20 feet tall when he opened the door and uh but just instantly there was a uh uh, very warm. I mean, anybody that meets Bootsy knows this. He's like got this very warm aura around him. Very, very. He's not doesn't not standoffish at all. It's, he's like a very, very giving person. And so had me in the studio, and um, we started uh, uh, playing this track. And I could kind of tell that he was, you know, it was like a little different. I could there was something going on. And I think, you know, on a musical side, the bass line here, I know we're not really getting into real heavy playing yet, but I'll just play a little bit. The, uh, can you hear that okay? Yeah. Okay. So the bass line was something really, really simple. It was like, um, uh, it was like. That something that simple, okay, and I and I kept it that you know my theory on the reason why Bootsy and I connected so much. You obviously have to ask him to get the full story, but I think the reason he kind of dug where I was coming from is I, there was like a four or five minute song or whatever it was. I stayed on the the whole time. I did, wasn't like you know trying to show my chops off, showing how fancy I was. And I, I'm assuming like a lot of times when bass players get around boot. They want to kind of start instantly showing how flashy and stuff they are. And I was just about playing the groove. Right. Now, it helped a lot because Bootsy was running me through his rig in the studio. And I mean, if you just barely touched it, I mean, it shook the whole. <laughs> it was so not just loud, but just like moving, you know, glasses could break, you know, and it was, which was awesome. As a bass player, I was like, this is great. Right. So, and I was running through a bunch of crazy effects and I, and I kept messing with his effects. And he's like, as the session went on, he's like, man, you got that freaky bass thing kind of going on. And then as I say, I don't think he knew, could remember my name real well. Cause he just had met me. And so as the net went on, he's like, like freaky bass thing started becoming, Hey freak and the Hey freak bass. And then people in the, around the, the studio started calling that. And that's kind of how the name kind of like stuck from there. And so from then on, he just started calling me freak bass and that's just kind of what stuck. Yeah. I love it. When Bootsy Collins gives you a nickname, that's an honor. That's high praise, right? Uh, yeah, it was cool. I, I felt it. So it was good. Yeah. It worked out great. <laughs> That's fantastic. What did you learn? What's the, what are some of the biggest things you've learned from Bootsy? You know, of course, when I, when we first hooked up, I was like, I'm like, oh, I'm going to learn all this great bass guitar stuff and all this kind of stuff. And there was part of that, but, uh, but the majority of it was he really got me schooled on how to get around in a recording studio and the difference between recording a studio track versus a live track, the way you approach your playing for, for each type of uh, version of that song, 
um, you know, how to do programming. Uh, we, we were using an MPC 2000 sampling uh, sequencer. So, um, you know, he really showed me how to get around on that and about recording uh, equipment. So that was a big part. And then also just, we, you know, I would go to the studio for three or four hours. We would just sit there and rap. And it was mostly about the music business and just basically keeping your, you know, this business, as we all know, I mean, you can have the highest of the highs and the lowest of lows. So it's like, you know, it's like a roller coaster. And if you let those highs or lows get you, you'll just be an emotional, you know, train wreck. And uh, so he really kind of, you know, put me, you know, on that good path of just being, you know, don't get too, you know, overly excited about something really good happens because then when something that not so good happens, you're not going to go the other way too as well. So it's kind of more keeping an even keel, you know, be as crazy as you want on stage, you know, but when off stage, just kind of keep it even keeled. And, uh, so, yeah, I mean, he's definitely from the, you know, teach a man to fish versus give him the fish school of thought. And, uh, that was huge. And, um, you know, and you know, every day I'm just, you know, blown away that I met this. I mean, he's just for anybody that, and, and you're listening or watching audience, if you ever get a chance to, to meet this man or, or, Sam, he's just really just an incredible person and, you know, incredibly talented, obviously, yeah. too, as well. Great, great. Everybody knows him for his bass playing, but he's an incredible producer, writer, all that kind of stuff, too, is which is kind of the phase of the career that he's in right now, more being almost a production mentor type, yeah. almost like a Quincy Jones type cat. Wow. And um, yeah, so it, it was great. Yeah. Amazing. Freak, can we talk about the music business? You mentioned that, and that's a, a thing that I talk a lot on my show with artists about the the ups and downs as you mentioned the the highlights the challenges yeah and and some of the stuff that you've been through both the the pros and the cons and what how you might advise a younger musician that's coming up sure today. yeah well like i mentioned in the conversation about like i would have with bootsy is this you know you really there's just so many like especially when you tour touring is the thing you gotta like it's it's real easy to get on that that um, you know that treadmill, and then you just keep going, want to keep going and go faster. Because the thing is, when you're going to a different town, everybody, you know, when you're playing in a new town each night, people are like that's their party. They're there for you. That they've been gearing up all week for this one night for you to right. be there. They don't understand you've been out seven, eight, nine, ten, whatever long you're out at that point. Yeah. And um, so you know. I'm not saying to go hide in a corner or anything at the same time, but you definitely want to try to keep, remember that you have a show to do the next night and the next night and the next night and the next night. So you just want to kind of keep everything on an even keel, whether it being, you know, I mean, it sounds almost like, you know, like a mom and dad thing, but it's like eating well on the road, you know, I mean, this is everything in life in general, but right. just definitely on the, on the road, you, you know, trying to eat as healthy as you can, um, drink lots of water, try to get as sleep is like, a luxury on the road so you know one thing I, I almost like they should have i almost like wish a music school they could like set up like a like a fake van or or bus in the school right. and that today kids we're going to learn how to sleep sitting up right. you know and that that should be a course you Absolutely. know i teach that course yeah. and uh because you just learn you know you got to learn how to sleep in different ways you didn't think you could do that type of thing too as well and it's don't you know it's all amazing too. I mean that for that you know hour to two hours you're on stage, it makes it all worth it. But you just got to kind of gear your whole vibe around that for touring. Now, as far as just the, the daily type things, um, you know, just again not getting too highs on the. I mean, there's going to be some great things that are hopefully going to happen for you in your music career. But even when those things happen, kind of just you know obviously enjoy it and relish in it too as well. But just realize that's just one part of the journey, and there's a lot more to the journey than that. And it is this this music business. I mean, it's it's a journey, you know. It's it's uh, the, and the journey is actually the can be the most fun part. You know, you think you're always like, oh, if I just get this, and I, you know, I've done that so many times. If this just happens in my career, well, I had that happen, and it's like, yeah, but I want more. You know, it's yeah. it's always more. So just enjoy the journey as much as you can. I guess is is a way to to phrase that too as well. And I'm and now I'm like I'm really thinking about that class. I'm gonna have to get a hold of Berkeley and see if they want to teach sleeping in the van class or something like that. <laughs> you got to teach that class, freak. That's great. I know. I'm down with that. That's yeah. a that's a real life uh, class experience, right? 
Yeah, I, I'm, jo- I'm kind of joking, but I'm kind of serious, right. too. I mean, you do. I mean, you do have to sleep in weird places. And the more you, any ch- chance you can get it fitted in, get it in, you got to do it. Yeah. No question. And, and also, Freak, what about the hustle as far as, I mean, the music business has changed dramatically since sure. it, even when you started, the hustle of getting your music out in different places. What are the pros and cons that you've seen around that? Well, I think one thing that is is even in the last three to four or five years, that's really changed a lot is that it used to be you were doing an album and you would tour to promote the album. It feels like it's flipped to where the album is producing your tour or is promoting your tour, you know, so you want to put a good record out to try to create, get better ticket sales at your shows and stuff like that. So that's, that's kind of been a big flip, obviously with streaming and all that kind of stuff. That's really changed the game quite a bit too as well. Um, But I think it's all exciting because, you know, things like Spotify and Apple music, you can kind of start, you know, and, and obviously with Facebook and Instagram and stuff, it's so easy to like target where, yeah. you know, if you can just create whatever your fan base is, right. you know, no matter how big or how small, if you can like target those, those, those fans and supply, I mean, you'll be, you'll have a career for your whole life, right. you know, and it's, so it doesn't really matter how big or small they are, as long as you are loyal to the, you know, you have keep a relationship going with those. So that's the best thing I think about social media is that you're able to have that one-on-one yeah. relationship type thing. I mean, if someone sends you a, a message on Facebook, I mean, I try to as much as I can to answer it as quickly as I can. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, again, it's about creating those relationships and with that, that, you know, that niche audience, whatever it is, like trying to, you know, make them, you know, maximize that, that potential as much as possible. And the other thing I would say too, as well is also is, trying to keep product con- constantly moving some kind of new music, you know, like uh, people were asking us, what are you guys going to color red for in November? You just, you're still out touring for your album right now. And it's like, well, that's going to be, as soon as that's done, people are going to want something else and we're going to want to do something else too as well. So it's always yeah. about getting more, a constant flow of material out there all the time. And I think it's always a good thing to keep fans engaged. You know, it's all about engagement. I mean, you know how you do your phone, you're like, like this, you know, the whole right. time. And, you know, the attention span is like this, you know, right. so it's like you want to give people a reason to stop and click on whatever you're doing, whether it's listening or watching or whatever the case may be. Absolutely. And you, you're growing and you're evolving as an artist. And speaking, speaking of being on tour, you guys are starting again this Friday night, the 13th at Rockwood Music Hall in New York City, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, we're going to be the night before. We're actually in a music festival and outside of Boston called Wormtown Music Festival. And um, and then, yeah, you said Friday night where we were playing uh, Rockwood Music Hall and um, uh, it's called Stage Two at Rockwood. I guess they have a couple stages, but we're playing there Friday night at uh, not, uh, I think doors are nine. We play at 10 o'clock and uh, super excited. It's Sammy's hometown. Sammy's from uh, she's from New York City or her parents live in Manhattan. She grew up on Long Island. Nice. I think she, she lives right outside of Brooklyn right now. So it's kind of like a hometown show for her. And, you know, I love New York more. I mean, it's such an amazing, it's a magical city, as we all know. And so it's always exciting to get to play there. Yeah. And, and Freak, say again, we, we lost the feed a little bit. Say again where you're playing the night before on that Thursday, too, please. Sure. The Thursday we are at a music festival. It's called Wormtown Music Festival. It's in, I believe, Greenfield, Massachusetts, which is basically outside of Boston. Right. And it's it's an amazing festival. It's been going on for many many years. Some amazing acts play there, and uh, we're doing the first night there. So I'm, I think we're doing like a late night. The first night they kind of do like a late night kind of bring everybody in and get a little crazy in that first night. So we're kind of like popping the cork that first night. So it should be really fun. I love it. It's funk. It's freak bass and the bump assembly. I love the name of that band. That's fantastic. It's oh, really thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, well, it's definitely it's definitely a collective, so so it, it makes sense, you know. You bet, no question. And the mm-hmm. whole the whole vibe between you you guys and the audience becomes the collective as well. There you go. Yeah, say a little bit more, freak, about some of your inspir- in addition to Bootsy, some of your inspirations yeah. musically, whether bassist or otherwise, and any important teachers that came into your life. Sure. Wow, that's a great great question on both. So. Um, as much as I love funk and, uh, you know, funk is who I am and how I breathe, you know, I was growing up, I was like, as much as I was into that, I was into Rush and Getty Lee. And of course, like every bass player, I went through my Jocko phase, like where I wanted to be Jocko, like everybody, you know, went and got a bass, ripped the frets out the whole nine yards, you know? So, uh, so yeah, so those have definitely been, you know, and I've always been roaring to the, like, 
I mean, I, I love groove and all that kind of stuff, but like what got me into funk, it wasn't just the groove, it was the songwriting too, whether it would be Stevie Wonder or Sly and the Family Stone, bands like that where like, the, you know, even if you took all the, the drums and the bass away, you could still play it on, a, on an acoustic guitar or piano and the songs would still stand up, you know? And to me, that's that's the ultimate sign. It's all that's that's what has the that's what makes things like songs immortal is when they have that kind of the song. It, it's about the song, you know, too, as well. And uh, so, yeah, like I mentioned Stevie Wonder, you know, David Bowie was a huge influence of mine. Um, I loved the more musically yes. uh, what he did multimedia. Same with Talking Heads, David Byrne and Talking Heads. Same thing, you know, where it's all about because, you know, to me, music is. You know, the music's a big, thing, obviously the main part of it, but also there's the visual side of it too, which is, you know, whenever I'm on, I'm from that school, it's like, if you're going to see a show, it's a show. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's the whole thing that goes along with it. And, you know, artists like Bowie and George Clinton and Bootsy and those are, it's always been the ones that have, and I think the visual thing is kind of a byproduct of what you're doing musically, you know, um, if I got up on, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people who are like, man, who's that crazy guy wearing that crazy clothes on stage? And it's like, you know, if I probably saw someone like me, I might say that too. But if I got up on stage with like t-shirt and jeans on, I would feel silly. You know, God bless you if you do that and that's your thing. That's great. That's that's your vibe. But but for me, it's just it's just it's just a different kind of approach. And uh, and I think it's from the artists that I mentioned too, of being being influenced by them so much too as well. So. Yeah, yeah, you you got to feel that energy as well, right? So sure, yeah. definitely, yeah. Now the other thing I was curious about too is you do a show like this as well for bassists. Say more about that, freak. Yeah, well, yeah, I got a few. Th so on that vibe, um, and I'll I'll do a little bit of, of breaking news here too as well on your show. But let me start with with. Uh, so I write for a um, a magazine called Bass Musician Magazine, where I I have a feature each month, which is called Bass to Bass. And, uh, it's where it's me interviewing another bass player and, um, uh, you know, I've had uh, Mike Gordon from fish, uh, uh, Stefan Lassard from Dave Matthews. I've got, um, coming up this month, I've got, a, I don't want to tell that one yet. Cause it'd be super exciting coming up. It's just, it's a biggie though. But, and, um, um, uh, uh, so it's been, it's great. Cause I kind of come in a kind of a quirky, you know, it's more about a bass player talking to another bass player, mm -hmm. kind of like not, not just, Hey, what pedal do you play? But like, you know, being on the road, what's your favorite truck stop to stop at or whatever, just some, some more quirky questions that might be, you're not your normal question. Great so question. I do that monthly. I do, uh, with them. I also do, uh, about once a week, I do something called, uh, bass camp, which where I take a pre-existing song, um, from any era. And then I add kind of a new baseline to it wow. too, as well. So yeah, you could, they're all posted on my Facebook and YouTube page and stuff. So, Can you give us and that's really, uh, Sorry. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm trying to think of one. Like, uh, what did I do recently? I mean, I'll do. I mean, I'll be all over the map. I'll do something. Um, you know, uh, I did an old. There's an old '80s song by Grace Jones called "I'm Not Perfect, But I'm Perfect for You." So I did that, and then I might do something more, uh, uh, more current. Like, um, I'm trying to think of some, somebody we did. Oh, I did a Marshmallow song. If your view, viewers know Marshmallow, but he's a big, big DJ, dresses like a marshmallow. So I, that was one of my first ones I did. I did a Marshmallow one too as well. And then just kind of put a different spin on it, you know, additional bass track on it too as well. Um, and um, so, and then I also have a podcast I just started with another gentleman. A gentleman interviewed me. He writes for uh, a music publication called Live for Live Music, and then he also has a podcast where he interviews different musicians. He we had the, he interviewed me for a show, and we started talking off air about uh, superhero movies. I'm a, like a superhero geek. I'm like like ridiculous with it. So now we we started what's called the Backstage Supercast, where we sit there and we talk about superhero movies. So I've okay, kind of got cool. that thing going too as well. And that's kind of a yeah, there's all kinds. Of, I mean, there, we're one of a million of those, but there's some really good ones out there. And it's just, you know, people that are into that kind of stuff. I mean, again, it goes back to almost the musician thing we were talking about a little earlier in your show. It's like everything's so niche nowadays. It's yeah. like, you know, there's a podcast. If you if you like fishing, there's a podcast about fishing. If you like superhero movies, there's one about that. And so it's pretty, pretty exciting to do that, too, as well. So, yeah, so kind of keeping multimedia kind of things happening all over the place. But um, the thing I was talking about breaking, starting next month, we're going to uh, start an actual live show, YouTube show. It's going to be called Live from Baseland, and, which is the name of the stu my studio here in Cincinnati. Nice. And uh, I'm going to do, it's going to be kind of like a little bit of a mini talk show. I'm going to have different guests on, those, um, predominantly musical guests. 
um, and then I'm going to hopefully play with them for like five or 10 minutes. You know, we'll just kind of do a little jam and then we'll talk about what they're doing. Kind of with like what you're doing with me, except we'll be there in a studio together type thing. Yeah. That's fantastic. Freak day. So it's live mm. from Baseland. Yep. So, yeah. And that'll be on YouTube starting, uh, probably mid October. Yeah. What's your YouTube channel so that folks can find that? Yes. Yes. Please subscribe. That's, that's, that's a big part. Well, we, we, you know, everybody puts so much emphasis on Facebook that, you know, YouTube kind of gets lost in the shuffle sometimes, but we're going to kind of, we're going to make it YouTube centric and, uh, the YouTube channel, obviously youtube.com and it's the freak base channel. And that's T H E for those who don't know, it's F R E E K B A S S channel C H A N N E L. So the freak base channel, uh, forward slash. That's fantastic. Yep. I love that. Well, thank <clears> you. Me. So I got to go back then, Freak, as far as you're doing this uh, uh, superhero uh, movie podcast yeah. thing. Top one or two superhero mo superhero movies of all time of yours? Oh, my gosh. Well, you know what? As I think we're getting my, – my top might change here in about a month because they're getting ready to release that new Joker movie comes right. out in a month with right. Joaquin Phoenix, yes. which – it, it just won the 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 top award at Venice Film Festival. I mean, it's like the first comic book movie that's ever done that before. So, and I'm a huge Joaquin Phoenix fan. But what I've seen already, probably, I mean, there's so many good ones out now. If I had to really choose, it would probably be The Dark Knight, which is you know Christopher Nolan's you know uh, class. You know, it's now a classic, even though it's not that old. But it's uh, you know, and even and then second would probably be Batman Begins, which is his first one. You know, those are just done. Yeah. I really like when they they take. Uh, like a superhero and kind of make it seem like is it like with Nolan's where if that person really was in our society it's not some I mean I love the Marvel stuff too and that's sure. great stuff too as well but the Nolan thing that the realism of it I you know and, and Batman you know he doesn't really have superpowers he's just right. kind of this eccentric guy with right. some some issues you know and uh <laughs> and uh so yeah so but like I said when this this Joker movie comes out next month I mean that, that may change everything you know I'm super excited about that and of course I love all the Marvel stuff too I mean I just watched Endgame last night again for the second time and that that's amazing too that stuff's great I mean the good thing is there's so much good quality out there that it's keeping the 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 level of quality great great right now you know so for all the musicians I mean there's a couple little ones that aren't so good but the majority of the the product for the superhero genre right now is real and really good oh, yeah. you know it's huge, right? It's it's ever and, yeah. and I I couldn't agree with you more. I think the Dark Knight takes it. Uh, it he you know Nolan totally changed everything, right? So, oh, he did. Yeah. I mean, that changed the whole ball game right. with him too, as well. And Christian Bale, you know, and of course Heath Ledger, who won the Academy right. Award for yeah. Joker. It's just like yeah. you know, you, and Gary Oldman. I mean, you can just go on and on. It's just amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the and you know one thing, one thing that's not mentioned enough about that maybe one of the things that makes it so great too is the soundtrack by Hans Zimmer. Yes. That is that's yes. I mean uh, I mean his his the, he did uh, I think it was at Coachella two years ago he actually performed the Dark Knight with an orchestra at Coach you know it was all mostly like DJs and rock groups right? and stuff but Hans Zimmer came out on stage with a full orchestra both electric and also you know stringed instruments and did the Dark Knight there live and people just went crazy for it yeah amazing amazing I didn't yep. know that. <clears throat> Is that ever something that you would want to do is be on a movie soundtrack? Oh, without a doubt, yeah. for sure. Yeah, definitely. I did I had this little side project I did a couple years ago. It was kind of a, a little super group from the, the music circuit that I tour, and it was called The Band is Bond. And we did the whole show. We did all themes from the James Bond movies. And so our, our initially, initial uh, goal for that, and we still may put it together again here soon, is uh, – you know, we were going to do obviously all those songs, but initially the band is Bond would do a theme song from that's my that's if I ever get to do a James Bond, that's like my ultimate bucket list is doing a theme song from a James Bond movie. I'm a huge James Bond fan just as much as I am a superhero fan. And especially those those songs, the, the way that they're written, you know, there's always that theme that you have to kind of has, like weave yes. into whatever song you yes. write with that, that main theme from the very first movie. And, um, yeah, that, that's definitely a big, big bucket list thing for sure. Yeah, I love it. That's fantastic. So any movie directors or producers watching right now, go to free. There you go. Com, get in touch with this guy. He'll, he'll uh, be on the record. So that's fantastic. You got it. So the latest album is all the way this, all the way that we've got free freak base on the show. Freak, is there anything else that we can cover before we kindly ask you to play? Oh, sure. Uh, I mean, I think we've covered, I mean, quite a bit of it. You know, I mean, the biggest thing is, you know, 
for people watching, you know, hopefully you'll come to a show, uh, like just go to freakbass.com, F R E E K B A S S dot com. And there's a little tour section in there too, as well. Sign up for our, you know, there's a thing you can sign up on bands in town. So you get notified when we're going to be in your town and any town that you may want us to come to that we haven't been to yet, please do that too, as well. So that's, that's, that's our, uh, that's our livelihood and bed and butter coming to the show. And that's the main, you know, that's where we connect with people more than anything else. Touring is always the best part of this whole gig for me at least. And, and so, you know, the more we can uh, connect with people in person, the better. Yeah. Actually, <clears throat> excuse me. I, another question that came up is, uh, sure. you obviously the very cool thing about you freak is you are a bassist and a drummer. So you got both uh, sides of the brain working there. Tell me a little sure. bit about, I'm, I'm a drummer as well the importance of the rhythm section in the band, what are the things that drummers most and bassists most need to know to lock in with each other? Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, the simplicity thing is more, you know, I love all the icing and I'll get crazy and do all the crazy stuff too as well, but you gotta be the group, you know, okay. My favorite bass line of all time yeah. is three notes. It's, it's it. <laughs> And you know what? What Jam that's James Jamerson. Papa was a Rolling Stone. That's all. That real song, not the single version, but the real version is 12 minutes long, and he plays that exact bass line the full 12. Does not put any kind of fit. It's just so you're playing the space. It, and maybe this is kind of a good thing. The space is as important as when you know when you're not playing is most as important as you are. Make the space part of the music too, as well. So. And so, yeah, start there too as well. Start simple. And, uh, you know, again, the, I love all the icing, but you got to make the cake taste good before the icing will taste good. It doesn't, you can only, yeah, you can put so much icing on it, but the cake's not there in the first place that, it, you know, that it's not, it's only going to go so far. I love it. I love it. It's all about the groove. It's your friendly neighborhood freak base, everybody. Freak, thank That's you so right. much. Thank you so much for being on the record today. This is awesome. Can we, uh, can we be so so lucky to have you play a little bit on the show and um we might need you to back up a little bit just so that we can see the yeah bass. so you can see the bass yeah how's that is that better yep and i'm gonna turn my stuff off here and just get out of the way let you do yeah the cool magic. and then and after i'm done playing you're gonna jump back on and yes. we say goodbye or yes, we just we exactly. okay good and yes. So I'll tell you about, I'll just play a little bit of this track. This is uh, the opening track off All the Way This, All the Way That. It's a song called Knuckle Sandwich. And um, it was a song we were working on in the studio. <clears throat> we're kind of getting to the end of the recording. And Eddie, who is the producer, Eddie Roberts, he's like, you know, do you have anything? You know, just kind of a real just nasty, thumpy groove, you know, because a lot of the stuff I'm doing on the album, I'm doing a lot of finger kind of playing stuff. And, uh, but, you know, I'm kind of known for and definitely live. I'm doing really just beating the heck out of this thing. So we wanted to kind of take that approach to the song. And so uh, the song is kind of built around this bass riff that I'm doing. So I'll just do a little bit of it here too as well. And it's kind of for, for you musicians out there, there's a technique that I do. I call it the double thumb technique. Other players like Victor Wooten, uh, Marcus Miller, people like that do it as well. But it's basically, as opposed to just like thumping, like which is what I'm doing right here, you're also going through the string and coming up on the string. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like... Uh, So I'm like down, up, down, up, like that. So I'm actually going through totally in the string. So it's almost kind of like your thumb, kind of almost like a pick, but um, with up and down picking. But then you can also incorporate, you know, the side of your thumb for the thumping part. So you can kind of pull those all under one thing there too as well. That's awesome. I'm sorry to interrupt, Freak Base. Can sure. I, you got any space to back up a little bit more, a tidbit sure. more? Yeah. Just because we want to yep. see you in action on that bass. Is that better? Better. Better. Awesome. Okay, Fantastic. Good. Go for it. Yeah. So, all right. So here's a little bit of intro of Knuckle Sandwich, and I'll kind of kind of go off that a little bit. Here we go. Start. The song starts off like this. One, two, three, four.
So there's a little bit of it there right Love there it. for you. That is fantastic. Okay. Man, thank you, thank you. I could feel that all the way over here in the Motor Studios in Portland, Maine. Man, that is awesome. All right, Man. that's wonderful. Great. Yeah, Freak Bass. Thank you so much for being on Musicians on the Record today. Have a fantastic tour, folks. Go to freakbass.com. Get this man's music. It's Freak Bass and the Bump Assembly, right? That is correct. Yeah. Yep. Going on tour soon. Thank you so much, Freak Bass, for being, uh, being on the record. Well, thanks for doing what you're doing, and uh, thanks for having me on today. I appreciate it.